Hello out there in Radio Land. This is Michael. This is the Street Preacher's Corner, the podcast where sometimes we sit and think, and sometimes we just sit. You know, I was grabbing a little snack before launching into this uh, this endeavor, and uh, if I just complain for just a second here before we get into the anything else. There is a snack food out there which I am in, I am intensely fond of their product, and um. I will not give them a, an endorsement. Um, I mean, I may, I may vouch for grits and sweet tea, but you know that's that's actually kept me alive. But um, this this particular product, um, truth be told, I love their product dearly. It is a uh, it is two round of black cookies with white stuff in the middle. How about that? Now we know. Now we all know what we're talking about. Love their product. Would buy it. You know, I don't buy it uh, uh, as often as I, as, I, as I would like to because if I'm sitting here with a box of them, I'll eat the whole box and then, you know, your pancreas shuts off. And it's just nothing good comes out of that. But I do love their product. And you, they do not have to convince me or persuade me to buy their product. But they could persuade me to not buy it. And they seem hell-bent on doing that very thing. Um, I, one, of the, one of the insane things about the world that we live in right now is that everybody has to have an opinion on every cotton-picking thing. And it just, sometimes it doesn't make sense. I do not need to know what this cookie company thinks about homosexuals. I do not need to know how fond they are of them. In fact, they, they could be completely, they could be just a bunch of sodomite-loving weirdos. And as long as they kept that to themselves, I would keep buying their cookies. Because I don't care. But for some reason, they and every other company in the world has to let everybody know how much they love that that particular demographic of people. To the exclusion, to the... To the I, I just don't know why you would risk offending normal people to appeal to the perverse. What's I got doing anything? I know I'm just I'm I'm just I'm, I just wish things I just just you know just leave stuff just you know the the old, the, the the saying of shut up and take my money that that's a thing just shut up and take my money I don't need to know. Uh, my favorite example of this we are we are going to get to the Bible I promise you. Um, my favorite example of this is because um, all these celebrities, all these companies, all these everybody they got to let you know what they think about everything. And uh, once upon a time, a reporter, a female reporter, asked Elvis Presley what he thought of the Vietnam War. And Elvis said something to the effect of, I'm a singer, honey. Don't nobody care what I think. There's a man that understands his spot in the economy of life. I mean, I'm sure Elvis had an opinion. but, And I also think it's great that he could... Get away with calling a female reporter sweetheart, and nobody went and burned a city to the ground. I, you know, I really am becoming an old man that just yells at clouds. So, uh, anyway, what we're going to be talking about today? Now we've t- covered all those other things that don't matter in the slightest. We're going to talk about Jesus Christ and his relationship to death. It's just—it's not super deep. It's not super. I covered a lot of it in 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 in, uh, in uh, Mark lesson um, eight, I guess it was. So we're going to start, start in Romans 5. Jesus and death. Uh, Romans 5, verse 12. Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for the of all sinned. For under the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So it's a common mistake for people, lost people in particular, to look at the broken, terrible world they live in, a world full of rape and a world full of murder and a world full of, you know, puppies dead, dying and little babies dying and, and houses burned to the ground and, and wars and famines and pet plagues and pestilence and, and corruption. And, 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 and they look at a place, the world they live in, where death reigns. And they blame God. But death, according to scripture, is man's fault. You say, why do bad things happen? 
because of Adam? Why did such and such have to, uh, uh, you know, why did my grandmother die? Or why did this thing happen? Why did the house fire happen? Why did my puppy get out in the middle of the road and get run over? Adam, the whole world is broken because of Adam. God created a world of, of life and righteousness, a world without sin and sorrow and suffering and disease and poverty and famine. It was a world without death. And the man that he put in charge of that world brought an enemy into that world. And when he did, he brought a curse upon creation itself. Not just, he brought, he brought, he brought, he brought death and he brought sin nature to his body. Look at, look at Romans 8. Just a couple of pages over from where we're at. It says, uh, uh, verse 21, But the creature itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption and the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. So according to the Bible, all of creation suffered when Adam fell. And all of creation, I mean, you know, rocks and trees and trees and rocks and rocks and trees and trees and rocks and water. Uh, they, they, uh, it, it groans under the weight of what Adam did. The reason you have hurricanes, the reason you have floods, the reason you have tornadoes, the reason you have all this stuff that happens is because not only is mankind broken, but the whole stinking world is broken. Nature itself is broken. Nature itself is falling apart. You're falling apart. I'm falling apart. Everything around you is falling apart. The only thing that you have that's not touched by the curse is your Bible. Your preacher is touched by your curse. Your everything, everything is touched by the curse that Adam brought into the world. He literally broke the world. So if you're looking for a textbook example of you can pick your actions, but you can't pick your consequences. Excuse me. Look at Genesis 3. I've wondered. The Bible says in another place how Adam was not deceived, how Eve was deceived, but Adam was not. And I don't know how far to take that personally. I don't know if it means that Adam really understood the full consequences of his actions. Did Adam understand when he chose his wife over God, which is what happened, when he chose his wife over God, did he understand because of that he was going to bury his children? Did he understand that because of that some of you were going to bury your children? Did he understand that because of that I have weeds in my yard and a bad leg and a car that barely runs, and, 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 and the roof's coming in. You know, i got leaks in the roof. Did he, sitting back there at, in Genesis, did he, could he see the full deal of what he brought into the world? Every famine, every sickness, every grave can be laid at Adam's feet to a certain extent. And I think it's worth mentioning that um, sometimes God judges you by what he you puts your descendants through. You know, and, and uh, children of Israel get carted off to Babylon there in Jeremiah. And there are kids who are born in Babylon who have to live under Nebuchadnezzar's foolishness. Um, and they, you know, they, they, the nation had fallen into idolatry. God had warned them and warned them and warned them. And then God says, okay, we're done with this. I'm going to I'm gonna put you guys on a, on a, on a slow boat to, to, to Nebuchadnezzar land. And uh, so, so their kids, the people that that sinned against God, their kids are born in bondage, and that's not God's judgment on those kids because those kids weren't idolaters. That's God's judgment on the parents. So, part of God's judgment on Adam is that his descendants were going to be under the power of death. I, I don't know, man. Did, did Adam understand that they would bury Abel? Did he understand the the, 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 the the toil and the suffering that comes from the whole world being broken? Did, did he did he see the Spanish flu uh, killing 100 million people in the 1910s? Did he, did he see the Nazi death camps? Whether he saw it or not, he unleashed it. And man has never gotten past Genesis 3. Mankind has got all kind of crazy ideas about how they're going to do this and how they're going to do that. You know, uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil. 
talking about loading your brain up into a computer. All that is an attempt to get past Genesis 3. That's why it is going to fail. Because if you come up with a way around it, then God didn't do a very good job. And we've tried. But no matter how fast or how far you run, death gets everybody. Catch Always catches his man. There is no run. There is no escape. There is no cure for death. So Romans 5, verse 19. The Bible says, For as by one man, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall be many be made righteous. Made sinners. Now I don't know if anybody really gets this. And I've heard the argument that we sin because we're sinners or we're sinners because we sin. And I, I don't see why both couldn't be true. The Bible says that God gave the law to man to try them. The law, he gave them to men to try them, to prove them uh, to their own unrighteousness. Um, he gave the law. Look at 1 Timothy 1. He gave the law to men who were already sinners. He gave them the law so, because of what men already were before he gave it. Verse of Timothy, First Timothy one, verse nine. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to that glorious gospel of the blessed God which is committed to my trust. So, so. You don't make laws because men are good. You make laws because men are bad. And as evil men and seducers have waxed worse and worse, what you have, you have, you have to pass more laws. You know, you know, one of the things they're coming up with now is they, they. Uh, mm, do I even want to talk about this? Okay, so, so. People, ever since photography has been a thing, people have enjoyed looking at naked pictures of other people. Some of the first photographs ever taken are of naked people. It's just, it's true. And so that has become a multi-bajillion dollar industry that enslaves men and women and, and ruins families and, and just, just destroys everything it touches. Um, that's morphed into photo, still photos to videos and, and everything else that goes on. And then, uh, not content with that, some people will roll the age back a lot. And they will cultivate in themselves appetites that are ungodly. You can expose yourself. You can start off a normal person, and you can expose yourself to things that will make you into a weirdo. You can create appetites in yourself by what you expose yourself to. Hold another message for a whole another time. So one of the reasons that, that the thing with little kids is, is, is illegal is because you have to use little kids to make that material. I mean, you, I mean right? You, you with me so far? And so, you know, we, 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 we at least pretend in our society to be concerned about the welfare of children. And so we passed a law saying, hey, you can't do that because to do that, you have to use little kids and, and we're, not, we're, not, we're not up for all that. So what mankind has done in his ceaseless uh, pursuit of his own uh, flesh and the ceaseless pursuit of his own gratification is he's come up with computer programs that can make fake children. And so now our law people, our lawmakers have to go, well, our reason for having this law to start with is because we didn't want kids to get hurt. There are no kids getting hurt in this thing that's going on now because there's no kids, actually, no real children actually involved. You say, why are you talking about this? Because men have to, you, you almost have to stay one step ahead of the most reprobate members of your society. And you pass a law and they'll say, oh, what about this? And you pass a law and they'll say, oh, we'll try this. And you pass a law and they'll say, we'll go this way. You pass a law and and the, the longer a nation 
mires and, and marinates in its own wickedness, the more laws you have and the less freedom you have. The reason the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, is because liberty, real liberty, is always tied to the righteousness of a group of people. If you have a society that where maybe not everybody is saved and maybe not everybody is whatever, but they try to honor God and they're and they're decent people and they work hard and they and they you know they got their problems like everybody else, but they're not they're not reprobates, they're not they're not perverts, they're not they're just you know good old garden variety sinners. Well, you can have a nation like that, and you can have some freedom there. Because you're not constantly have to guard against the new level of wickedness or the new crazy idea that somebody's come up with. But when you have a nation uh, that has rejected God and, 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 has, and rejected the Bible and has just decided to run downhill as quickly as they can, and, and glory and things they should be ashamed of, you literally can't pass enough laws to keep up with these perverts. But you got to do something, right? And so according to 1 Timothy 1, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and the disobedient. So, yeah, so God gave the law because of what men already were. So not only does Adam bring death into the world, but he breaks his children to the part where their natural inclination is to be against God. Yeah, I don't know, man. Kids are kids are amazing. I got I to mess up them. And uh, kids are amazing because you can have a a a thirty five pound human being that has as much willpower as a two hundred and fifty pound man, and you look at a man and they and they uh they just there's so much there's they're they're little balls of flesh and all they care about is themselves and uh that that they come from the factory that way, and that's part of a uh, part of uh the consequences of Adam's actions is is that you have to you have to str- you could be saved. And read your Bible every day, and have the Holy Spirit live within you, and, and be actively involved in ministry, and and uh, and be in fellowship with the other believers, and all this stuff going on, and you are still a scoundrel. Thank you, Adam. So there's a death that you inherited from Adam, and then there's a death that you earned. Look at Matthew four. See, I, I don't know sometimes that we always think all the way through about without Jesus Christ, how hopeless the whole thing is. And when you talk to a lost person that doesn't know any Bible and you tell them, hey, all this death that, 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 that you think is normal is not normal. It's an aberration. You know, it's funny. Your friend gets on a train, leaves town. You don't cry necessarily. I mean, unless you're some kind of, you know, sap or something. Even though you know you might never see them again, right? You won't. You may. You may not be a. You won't go into mourning because they left town. You won't go into mourning because they moved away. They die though. Something in you breaks. Something in you recognizes that this death thing is not something anybody signed up for. It's not something. I mean, they did, but they didn't. You understand, an animal doesn't understand, but you understand that this place is broke. What did I say? I said, uh, I said Matthew 4. <clears throat> uh, verse 16, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. You know, Psalm 23, I guess. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. Uh, death casts a shadow. I'll go even further. And I tell you what, let's look at the verses. I'll go even further. I will say that death appears to be an individual. When these guys, uh, you look at the old, the old uh, medieval drawings and stuff, and it has you know the the grim reaper's got the long cloak and he's got the big sickle and he's got the skull and bones thing. <clears throat> Excuse me, I think that uh, there's something to that. I think them old old school folks uh, they had been around enough Bible and they might have had all sorts of medieval superstitions going on, um, but they do some things. <clears throat> Verse uh, Revelation six verse eight. 
And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. Not Clint Eastwood. I looked, and behold, a pale horse. Oh, that is a great, that is a great movie. Uh, and his name that sat on him was Death, capital D, Death. And hell followed with him. So this guy on this horse has a name. It's a person. And his name is Death. So when they when they portray death in the old old stuff as as as, as an individual, uh, something there, man. I, I'm not saying every time that death is 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 uh, portrayed in scripture is portrayed as a person, but I I know over there in Exodus when the angel of death comes through, that's treated as a person. It's treated as an individual. An entity is going to come and do this thing to you. Well, here in Revelation six, an entity is going to come and do this thing to you. And so, um, so death casts a shadow, and men live in the shadow. Uh, they sit in the shadow of that that that, that darkness, and, and not only are they sitting in the shadow of the dark. Look at Ephesians five. Ephesians five. See, I think people don't. One of the hardest things when you go witness to people is to is to convince them of the reality of their condition. They see that these sort of things happen to everybody, and so they think it's normal, and they think it's no big deal. Ephesians 5, verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, and now are ye light in the Lord, walk as children of light. So not only were you sitting in the dark, in the shadow of death, you were part of that dark. It says ye were sometimes darkness. You say, well, that's, 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 you're just being clever with words. Well, look at John 1. If you're lost, you are in worse trouble than you could ever possibly imagine. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Look at verse 5. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. The darkness has comprehension because the darkness is not, uh, you know, a lack of light. The darkness is a group of people. It's you. It's me. You who were sometimes darkness. So God translates us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his, glo- his glorious son and all that. going. So, so Jesus Christ walk, comes into a world in which the devil, uh, Hebrews 5, has, has, has had the power of death for thousands of years and have run rough, roughshod over humanity for thousands of years. According to Philippians 2, he goes to the cross, tastes death for every man. That's not Philippians 2, that's Isaiah 53, but you know, you know what I'm saying. Submits himself unto death, become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Submits himself to his greatest enemy, the devil, to our greatest enemy, the grave. And by submitting himself to that enemy, he destroys that enemy. The relationship that Jesus Christ has with death is, is not is not is one is of someone who who went into the fight and came out the other side. I mean that's 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 amazing stuff. Um, look at First Corinthians fifteen. So he comes out the other side of the grave, victorious over sin, victorious over death, victorious over hell. 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, Bible says, Behold, I sh-, verse 51, Behold, I show you mystery. We shall all sleep, but shall all be changed. In the moment, the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Yeah, I, can't, I can't sing that. But anyway, we, we listen to, um, you know, um, I start to see a fiddle on the roof. No, handles Messiah, and that guy hits the, we shall be changed. Uh, this corruption, corrupt, you know, we, we went to a, a handle, we used to go to handles Messiah every year uh, down south of here to a a, 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 a production of it, and uh, I would get excited, and then one day we were asked to leave, so we haven't been back since. Um, when this corruption shall be put on, have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, 
Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, because of, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not vain in the Lord. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord, because Jesus Christ conquered death. He took the greatest enemy that mankind had, and he submitted himself unto it, and he destroyed the one that had the power of it. He comes out of the grave, and he has the keys of hell, and he has the keys of death, and now he's in charge of that thing. Look at Revelation 21. Actually, let's look at Revelation 20 first. 20. As I said before, if Jesus Christ had simply come and put himself on a throne in Jerusalem and ruled and reigned, he would have been a better king than they had at the time. He would have been, been, he'd still been the best king ever. But by submitting himself unto death, he accomplished way more than just a king, even an immortal king. Because he would still be presiding over a fallen creation where all of creation is groaning and travailing and, and waiting to be delivered. Revelation 20. <clears throat> um, the Bible says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, verse 6, on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So, you know, I, I'm still in a body of flesh. My, the, this thing I'm, I'm sitting in is falling apart. Uh, like everything else, and uh, so so I'm going to go to a grave someday. If the rapture doesn't happen, my heart's going to stop. Uh, Darnell's going to preach my funeral, and we're I'm, I'm going into a hole in the ground. But because of what Jesus Christ uh, accomplished on Calvary, the second death has no power over me. So that, that that once that that sentence is carried out, where this body stops and falls over and dies, Jesus Christ, First Corinthians 15, Jesus Christ undoes that he reverses death this body that i'm sitting in they're going to put it a hole in the ground it's going to get back up because of what jesus christ accomplished and then from there on the second death has no power over me the second death the the the, the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death the second death has no claim on me because of jesus christ and it says, uh, uh, verse uh, seven, uh, Revelation 20, verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. So, So, big picture wise, what Jesus Christ accomplishes by taking on his role as the last Adam, he fixes the thing that Adam broke. He unbreaks the world and it restores things to a place where there is no sin and there is no sorrow and there is no poverty. And the last enemy to be defeated is death. That death that could not hold him, that death that he surrendered himself to, that death that he obeyed when the fullness of time had come, someday he's going to put his foot on that death's throat and say, no more, we're done with this. I have won the victory, and I give this victory to whosoever will put their faith and trust in me. You see, it, it, is, a, it is a marvelous, multifaceted, gospel it is glorious what christ has accomplished on your behalf and on mine he took the enemy that we had the enemy that we have no power over according to ecclesiastes the enemy that we can't stop the enemy that he can't, he can't we can't outrun and he turned and he faced it head on and he defeated it he did that for you and did that for me glory be to god this is michael signing off i will see you on the other side